Oh, good afternoon, everyone. And um, my name is Jim Rooney. I'm president and CEO of the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce. And I want to welcome you uh, to this afternoon's BEMA Data Privacy Summit. Um, many of you on this Zoom or this event know that BEMA is the Boston Interactive Media Association, New England's largest digital media focused community comprised of over 3,000 digital media buyers, planners, and publishers with business interests in the New England market. Uh, and we're in a changing landscape of data privacy and identity after the third party cookie. Today, we'll aim to discuss how new regulations are impacting advertising and how companies can shift gears to maintain effective and measurable ways of reaching their customers. Before we begin, a couple of housekeeping notes. I wanna flag that each of the sessions today is being recorded and will be shared on the Chamber's YouTube page uh, shortly after today's event. So that will be available uh, for people to take a look back or, or let others know that they can take a look at what I know will be an informative set of discussions. Uh, and we want it to be interactive. So please submit your questions through the summit throughout the summit using the Q&A feature, or uh, you can also email questions to chamberprograms.com, um, excuse me, to chamberprograms at bostonchamber.com. So that's chamberprograms at bostonchamber.com. So uh, why don't we get started? I'd like to introduce Pam Ehrlichman from Jebit, who is going to lead our first session. Uh, of the summit, uh, Future Forward, the Rise of First Party Data. Pam is the Chief Marketing Officer for Jebit with over 25 years of marketing experience. Pam is responsible for making Jebit a household name among marketing professionals. Prior to joining Jebit, Pam was the Vice President of Marketing for Oracle Data Cloud, which included creation and growth of Oracle Data Cloud's industry first, the data hotline and the data lab brands, providing data strategy and education to brand, media and agency partners. Pam will be joined in this session by Juliana Deason. Juliana is the digital marketing manager for Bliss, where she leads all email marketing, SMS marketing, CRM and paid media efforts for the brand. Uh, so thank you, Pam. Thank you, Juliana, uh, for kicking off today's uh, session. Uh, and thank you to all of the speakers who will be joining us today. And now I'll hand it over to Pam. Great. Thank you, Jim. And thank you to the chamber for having us today. Hi, Julie. How are you? <laughs> I'm great. How are you? Good. We're we're hitting uh, two coasts on on the on this webinar today, um, but thank you all for joining. Um, Julie and I uh, are going to spend a little bit of time talking about Liss's uh, first party data strategy, and uh, I am honored and privileged that Jebit plays a small part in that. Um, Julie, just to start us off, for those that may not have heard of Bliss, I'm not sure if there are any, but do you want to tell everyone a little bit about Bliss? Sure. So um, Bliss is a skincare brand. Uh, we have been around for quite a while. Originally, we started with spas. Um, so we had four spas throughout New York, San Francisco, and LA. And then we transitioned to um, retail in 2018. So we are now sold in seven different retailers across the US. And we are a clean, cruelty-free, and planet-friendly skincare brand. So um, we actually also just got B Corp certified about two weeks ago. So we're really excited about that as well. Love that. Congrats. Thank you. All right. So let's let's start. A lot of people are here today, of course, because of the changes that Apple and, and Google have announced. And so a lot of brands are now scrambling, right? And trying to figure out how, how to collect and scale first party data. However, um, Bliss has been doing this before, way before it was cool. Um, Bliss has been focused on capturing first party data about their consumers um, for a long time. And so I guess the first, the first thing could you share with everyone is just what prompted Bliss to start focusing on first party data um, you know, way back when? Yeah, of course. So I have been with the brand for about a year, but um, prior to myself joining, I think what we really 
realized is that because we were a brand that was um, sold in drugstores, it was really hard for us to kind of follow our consumers throughout the purchase funnel. So um, if someone made a purchase in a drugstore, it was really hard for us to retarget them with marketing or just kind of um, follow up with them post-purchase. So we realized that because we do have um, a Bliss website, Bliss World, that was kind of our biggest opportunity to really kind of um, just continue speaking to our consumer um, pre and post purchase. So that was kind of something that, um, you know, when it comes to digital marketing is really important to create a conversation with your consumer um, wherever you can. So we saw that as an opportunity and we just kind of develop our strategy um, using Bliss World as our main um, lever for first party data. Yep. Um, it makes total sense. And for many brands, uh, there, a lot of brands now are having to shift strategies, right? They may have been, and, and this happens with manufacturers all the time, as, as you pointed out, you've got retailers in the middle, you, you're not the direct connection to the customer. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of manufacturers have been focusing on third-party data for a long time um, and, and now have to make that shift to first. But Bliss was never really in the, the third-party data game, uh, right? That's correct, right? Yeah, that's correct. I think for, for the most part, we just um, have been trying to leverage first party data as much as we can just to create a better um, marketing experience for the Bliss consumer. And, and I guess more importantly, right, when we're talking about skincare, Third party data doesn't really help you either with the kinds of questions that you really want to know um, about your consumers that are actually going to, to make more valuable conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think when it comes to, you know, consumers basically trying to get them to buy what they want, it's really important to just kind of ask them directly and kind of just figure out. And, you know, everyone that's shopping online is willing to kind of provide um, information if they are um, going to get kind of a really personalized experience at the end of the day. Right. And the pandemic was obviously a complete just catalyst for all of this, right? It forced, it forced manufacturers, if they weren't thinking about it, how, how they were going to actually create more relevant digital experiences now. Exactly. So let's talk. We, we've we've been we've been talking a little bit about obviously the the setup here and and what Bliss has been doing. But um, I think the best way to get everybody's heads wrapped around how you were doing this and how you're doing it at scale is to show them. So if we are, uh, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully this will all go according to plan here. But for everyone watching, we're on Bliss's site right now. And if you uh, roll over the this is Bliss section here you can see some of the quizzes immediately. And so the first one, Julie, let's talk about is the Find My Routine quiz. I think this is the first one Bliss launched um, and has been a huge driver for you. Yes, definitely. This um, quiz is about, I want to say two years old now. So this has really helped us um, tremendously with our data. Yep. So I'm just going to quickly go through this for everyone watching. Um, it's, it's obviously a product recommendation quiz. It's asking about skin type, location. I love that question. Not how old, how young is your skin? Thank you very much. <laughs> how much makeup do you wear regularly? Your skincare goal. This, of course, is a lead capture and you're giving an offer. At Javit, we see you don't, there's a lot of brands that do give an offer. Um, we've seen a lot of brands you actually don't need to, just giving that genuine value and that product recommendation back um, is, is enough. And then here you go. So based on the questions that I answered, I now have three awesome product recommendations. So Julie, this is on, this is on the site now, but um, this is launched in lots of channels, correct? Can you can yes. you share a little bit about the strategy with this quiz with this quiz? Yeah, so I think um, obviously when you give anyone a personalized experience and a really interactive experience, people love to engage. So we've seen really high engagement rates um, with this particular quiz. So part of our strategy is obviously marketing this quiz in a way that's valuable to um, just people visiting our Bliss website. So I think when it comes to marketing this quiz, um, you know, because we've seen such high engagement, we've pretty much um, used email marketing, SMS marketing, and social media to just kind of drive and even paid media to drive to this experience because we have seen such great engagement. And um, there is a value proposition to completing this for the consumer. So 
it comes off as a very genuine experience. And, um, you know, we're both kind of winning at the end of the day, they get a discount and we um, are gathering more data. Right. And I love that. And we go back to the the data and, and to your point about needing to ask the consumers, you can't get from anywhere else. What's my skin type? What's my, what's my, mm-hmm. you know, uh, skin combination and things like that. So mm-hmm. it, it's obviously really important that you're doing this in a way that um, is is highly accurate and direct. Yes, exactly. And I think, um, you know, the consumers are always very excited to take your quiz about and, you know, fill out their um, personalized skin type and all that stuff. Absolutely. All right, let's show one more and then we'll talk about some of the results you've seen. Um, which, clear skin? Yes. All right, let's pop into that one. So do you want to set up uh, a little bit about this one? Yeah, so actually we um, launched this quiz last summer when we launched our new Clear Genius line, which is an acne skincare line. Um, Part of the reason why we um, created this quiz was partially to um, gather data, but also to create like an experience that we could market to people to learn more about the new line. So I think, um, yeah, we've seen extremely good results with this quiz. And I think it's um, really engaging. And I love this because now we're flipping, right? The first one was a product recommendation. Now mm-hmm. we're using trivia. So to your point, it's a great, using trivia is a great way. Who doesn't love to take some sort of trivia test and, and uh, whether it's finding out what Harry Potter house you're in or anything else, mm-hmm. you know, consumers love doing these. Um, so I'm going to, and what I was going to point out here is you've got that extra time and space to reinforce your message, right? So whether they get it correct or will purposely get it um, incorrect this time, now you can give a teachable moment, um, which is a great and fun and so, you know, consumer first way to do it. I will definitely get this wrong (laughs) as I just quickly flip through, Um, but you're able to teach them about, about the different ingredients in the products. And of course, reinforce your your brand positioning of, of yeah. everything's clean. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. So I, I love that. Um, I will stop sharing my screen now that everybody has seen it. But let's um, can you can you share a little bit about um, some of the insights that you've you've learned and um, some of the performance that you've seen from doing getting collecting data this way. Yeah, so I definitely think in terms of insights, I was always impressed by, um, you know, the completion rate on these quizzes. I would say like we see a very, very high completion rate where, um, especially with the skincare match, we see about like 93% completion. So I think when you are creating these quizzes, it's always kind of like, oh, you know, I'm just trying to gather as much information as I can. But you have to be really thoughtful in like the questions that you're asking and like the data that you're gathering because people do complete these at a really high rate. So I was always impressed to see um, just that high completion rate and um, really good engagement rate. And I think also um, for Bliss, one of the most valuable things was actually our lead rate. So being able to gather those emails at the end is something that um, was really important for us as a brand because we are trying to gather um, and grow our database for email. And, um, you know, just managing the email database, I've seen um, a really um, big increase in leads since we launched these quizzes. So um, that's really important as well, because sometimes people just want to actually like engage in the quiz, but um, we do see a high rate of um, capture email captures as well. So that's been really exciting. Um, in terms of some of the tactics that we have used in order to market these quiz and promote quizzes and promote them, Um, We actually see a lot of the traffic on our website going to these quizzes. So, you know, when we're looking at, you know, where are people shopping on Bliss World and where are they engaging, these quizzes are always um, really high up there in terms of traffic. So that's been really exciting to see. Um, I think, you know, part of the online shopping experience, people don't always know what they want to buy if they're just browsing. So um, having those tools exposed at the top of our navigation has been really important for us. Just um, making sure that people are people know that we have these um, quizzes available for them is something that is really important. And um, every time we send an email um, to our database about these quizzes, we always see a really strong open rate and click through rate um, in terms of, you know, comparing that to our just our average marketing emails, we always see an increase there as well. 
Yeah. Um, you just, you just threw so there's so much to break down there. So I think all across the board, right. All of your quizzes, uh, that, that Bliss and Jevitt do together have seen in the high, you know, 90 plus completion rate, which is amazing. So for everyone listening, that means that the person, once you click into an experience, they're getting, they're getting all the way through like a high up, upwards of 90% of the people who, once they start the quiz, go all the way through, which is amazing. And then your point about, about the lead capture rate is, and, and I'm going to lead the witness a little bit, because we're going to start to talk about the next question, which is, an email alone versus an email and three really important data points is obviously infinitely more valuable to you as a brand because now you know how to talk to them relevantly, right? For the for that follow up communication, um, and and we'll we're going to touch on that a little bit more too in terms of what are you doing with the data and, and the next steps. But the last point I just wanted to echo and hit on what you what you said on email open rates and going back to again a more much more consumer friendly and consumer first way to engage is you've seen a two x um, increase in email email open rates. So instead of you know the subject line of just shop you know or buy now shop now giving them some giving the consumer something to engage with and and that's valuable to them. Um, certainly, you guys have seen some amazing results from that. Yeah, definitely. I think um, anytime you give customers a chance to talk about themselves and provide information and, you know, people really love feeling like they're um, getting a personalized experience. So when you have a subject line, like take this quiz, to learn about you or your skin, yes. like, what, what, like what products are right for you, the more personalized and, um, you know, you know, like very specific you get in terms of um, subject lines they are going to open at a higher rate. Yep, absolutely. Um, it's all it's all about me. <laughs> um, so so with that, you you capture this lead. You you've got now three, four really important pieces of data about them. What's happening after after then the post moment for you guys? Yeah. So for Bliss, we have quite a few um, CRM flows that people kind of are put into in the back end um, via email and SMS and all of our other touch points, paid media as well. Um, so when you complete the quiz, you're providing us not only your email, but you're also providing us with all these other data points. So basically what we do is we take the data points and then we kind of segment people into groups based on, you know, the answers to the data points that they provide. And then we market them throughout their purchase funnel. So if they haven't purchased, we can retarget them based on, you know, skin type or age range or like, you know, what products we think work best for them. So I think um, that's one thing is just being able to follow up with, hey, like you haven't um, redeemed this skincare code from taking the quiz to, okay, they did buy something and now I know that they have dry skin. So taking that data point into consideration um, in the post-purchase flow to, you know, show them products that are similar to what they bought based on their skin type. So, you know, they bought this moisturizer for dry skin. So now I'm going to show them this eye cream for dry skin. So just kind of um, creating these different segments and affinities to um, provide them with more relevant marketing um, content down the line. Love that. That's fantastic. And one of you touched on this earlier, and I want to I want to kind of double click into it. So one of the secrets of your success is consumers genuinely love the experiences, as you said, because they provide genuine value. Um, can you share some? We obviously just showed a couple a couple of things there, but can you share some of the ways you've delivered genuine value to consumers that have obviously resulted in the engagement that that you've gotten? So obviously, a pro getting a product recommendation is one form of genuine value. What are some of the others that you've tried or tested? Yeah, so um, I think in terms of genuine value, when people are provided exactly like you know when they're shopping online and they they know okay, these are the products that I need to buy for myself. Um, you know, we're providing them with an email that takes them directly to those products. We're providing them with the discount code. So I think just, um, you know, getting them to exactly what they need is is um, a priority for us as a brand. And I think, you know, there's other tax tactics that we use um, in general for our marketing flows and um, our onsite experience. So, you know, as soon as these people are put into their kind of groups where, um, you know, they're based on their skin type or what they bought in the past. Um, 
throughout our marketing flows, we like to show them products that they've clicked on, bought before, browsed before. So just um, kind of closing the loop and making it more personalized is something that's important to us. And we use um, several on-site kind of experiences to make these people feel um, hurt, like basically feel important while they're shopping. And I think um, especially if they're subscribed to email, it's something that's um, important for us to show them products, you know, um, that they've abandoned in their cart or that they browsed um, throughout those flows as well. Yep. And for, from Jebit's standpoint, we we typically see six, I'll, I'll talk about which one, which one's the most common, but six forms of genuine value that you give to the consumers. The one that, um, that Bliss has done beautifully, obviously, is the give me a recommendation, right, with the product finder that we went through and the, with the trivia test me, test my knowledge on something. Some, some of the other, just for anyone listening and, and, and curious about what, what are the other things that we typically see, it might be and, and, um, entertain me. Unlock, unlock a benefit for me, which is what Julie's, get, you know, with the email capture, you're you're unlocking and it could be an offer, it could be a piece of content, it could be, a, you know, if it's a loyalty program, we've seen um, uh, clients use loyalty points as something that you can unlock. Um, but yeah, that teach me, test me, give me a recommendation, save me time, save me money, all of those kind of forms of genuine value work really well um, if you're considering doing something like Bliss is doing right now. Um, so with, with that, and, and obviously you're, you've talked about the journey and setting up different, different experiences at different, at different points. Do you think this all helps with building brand loyalty, personalizing the consumer experience, um, across the board? Yes. I think brand loyalty is something that is extremely, extremely important to bliss because we, um, we are sold in a lot of drugstore and retailers that we don't have exposure to as much data information about our consumers in those retail stores. So because Bliss World is kind of our main um, point of gathering information about our customers, um, it's really important for us to develop brand loyalty for the people who do shop online with us. Um, we have a really loyal database of people that shop on Bliss World because they're very loyal to certain products and certain um you know, we have a lot of great offers on our website. So building loyalty and trust is important to us. And I think um, providing those customers with value um, propositions by shopping online is something that um, in the industry is probably the most important thing when it comes to getting people to repeat purchase on your website. Um, so just obviously um, getting them to the right products, getting them to repurchase again, and giving them offers and values to shop online, like discount codes and um, fun experiences like our quizzes, is very important to us to um, basically retain retain um, our current customers and um, gather new customers as well. Yeah. That's great. And one of the things that a lot of people, a lot of brands wrestle with, right, is the, the sweet spot between... Um, data and privacy, right? That's why this is, this is, this is what today is all about, uh, da talking about data and privacy. And so how do you find that sweet spot between using the data collected to create a personalized experience with the consumer while not creating privacy? You know, you've got to, you got to strike that right balance. So how, how does, how do you approach that? Yeah, so I think um, transparency is really important as a brand. Bliss is a very transparent brand. We always talk um, with our customers on social media. We're really transparent with, um, you know, our formulations, our, who we are as a brand, and um, we really communicate that to our customers. So I think in every, every single touch point that we are gathering data, we're always transparent in how we're using that. And, um, you know, you are giving us your email. So there's always kind of like those disclaimers throughout the website, um, you know, when you're taking a quiz and giving us your email or signing up for our email database or our SMS database. So I think just being really transparent is important. And then, um, you know, we, we try to create a personalized experience without um, kind of overwhelming the customer, making them feel like we're kind of giving them like too much personalization. So I think there is a fine line there. And I always try to make sure like, you know, we're, I'm also showing these customers new products or stuff they haven't seen before so that it doesn't seem like we're just showing them everything they're browsing and that's it. So I think there is kind of a delicate balance there. But um, so far, you know, we've been able to maintain the transparency pretty well on our end. That's, um, it's, it's really important. And we, um, 
we do a report on so you hit on you hit on transparency and we we do a report twice a year um called the consumer data trust index and so we go out and we ask consumers what um leads to what is what is uh, their relationship with uh, the brand as it relates to data trust? You know, how likely are they to trust a brand based on certain actions they do? And uh, we've been doing this study, I think it's about our fourth or fifth, every single time um, we do it, the number one reason that would lead to mistrust of a brand is asking for too much information. And so you hit on this before, right? Like you don't have to, the biggest thing that's changing with Apple and Google and what everyone was doing before with third-party data is brands were collecting these massive data lakes and just trying to get anything and everything they could. Mm -hmm. And I think what you, you've you proven beautifully, Julie, is like it only, it only takes four or five questions. Like it's really about focusing on what is important and what is it that's going to drive your recommendations and your conversation with the consumer and just focus on that. You don't need to know everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I also think having like a shorter amount of questions is going to help with the completion. It, right? it absolutely does. <laughs> people don't want to do like 10 different questions about themselves without they'll probably start feeling a little bit overwhelmed. <laughs> yeah. And then they'll, and then it starts to get into like, why are you asking me all of these things? So, you know, um, so you're right. We, we see across all the brands we work with, there is a sweet spot of, of four to five questions and then call it because you'll start to see those those uh those drop-offs yeah. the completion drape drop-offs happen um so the it, i guess a couple of things as we as we start to wrap up for anyone listening who is who is really thinking about how they're going to go about building a first party data strategy now what what would what advice what brands and um what insight would would you give um to anyone really starting on this journey yeah, so what I think about when it comes to first party data is thinking about kind of where your customers are, where are they shopping your brand and where the high traffic areas. So if you have, um, you know, a brand website, where are they already shopping on your website and can I show them something there that would um, prompt them to share their data. So whether it's, you know, their um creating an account or they're just browsing, that's like a great opportunity to kind of market um, an experience to them where you can capture more data. So, you know, if you're both, um, if your high, highest traffic page is your shop page, maybe there's something there that you can market within um, the products with like a banner or something, asking people to take a quiz to learn more or, um, if, you're so, if social media is your biggest engager, like maybe start there with something like, do you want to learn more about the brand? Is there a product you're interested? Take this quiz. Um, for another tactic that, um, you know, people that are really loyal are willing to share more information. So maybe it's something you can do with, um, you know, create in your account section, you know, like add your skin type or something like that. I think there's small places you can start to see if you're able to gather more data. And if it's something that's working, um, you know, there's several ways to promote and market these kind of experiences to your consumer. Um, so I think just thinking about where your consumers already shopping um, is where we kind of always start with bliss is, you know, like, is there more we can do here? Cause there's people that are already organically engaging with this content to begin with. Right. That's smart. And then, and then it's just a matter of, so how can you do something to engage, you know, entertain them or engage them a bit more? Yeah. We, we see across the board, um, if, if anyone's thinking about this, starting off with a product recommendation, um, quiz like that that kind of engagement mm -hmm. is by far um the 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 first kind of engagement that most most brands build starting starting off so i would recommend if you're if you're thinking about this and trying to figure out where to start certainly the genuine value of saving a consumer time answering a couple quick questions and getting the right recommendation for them um mm -hmm. is is absolutely a great way to start um a question came in julie that um I wanted to ask you here, which is pre-COVID, did you see more sales in person or in line? And what did the shift look like during post-COVID? I, I, I could have asked you, a mil asked you a million questions about the pandemic. I'm not sure where everyone's at or sick of talking about it, but it really is interesting, right? We saw such a massive shift to digital. Can you share a little bit about what Bliss, what Bliss saw there? 
Yeah, so Bliss is primarily sold in drugstores and um, our online retailers. So we're sold at Ulta, we're sold at Target.com, we're sold in um, Target's and CVS's in store and Walmart. Um, so actually, we the majority of our business was done in brick and mortar in the stores. So um, going into a Walmart, Walmart or going into Walgreens or a CVS, and um, obviously during the pandemic, we saw a huge shift in consumer behavior where nobody was wanting to go into stores to shop. So what happened was um, BlissWorld.com, which is our D 2 C website, um, you know. It, like historically we saw high traffic, but um, what happened basically is our traffic started going through the roof. So we saw a complete shift from in-store shopping to blissworld.com. And um, a huge part of that was an in increase in email subscriptions and um, SMS signups because typically first time shoppers are going to sign up for email and SMS because they want that welcome discount. Um, so that was a huge shift for us and prioritizing those channels was really, really important for us because we were just getting a huge influx in customers. And, um, you know, historically Bliss World was kind of more of a brand destination versus a e-commerce like high um, conversion website. So we really were used to kind of just having these like beautiful landing pages and like on-site experiences to prioritizing actual, um, you know, business and revenue. So that was a huge shift for us. And I think, um, you know, prioritizing the D2C website um, allowed us to gather a lot more data. And that was one of the biggest value propositions for us as a brand is now we have all this wonderful data that we weren't getting from a CVS or a Target. So, um, you know, ever since the you know, beginning of the pandemic, we've seen that shift in traffic and, um, you know, we've just kind of ran with it and been able to harness as much data as we can to create a better experience for consumers. Yeah, that, it's 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 really smart. Obviously, so many were forced <laughs> forced to do it and do it quickly. But to your point, if you're a manufacturer and you can you can create a lot of value on a site and drive it as a destination, um, you know they're 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 going to go and 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 out, and now you can build the conversion part of it, right? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, another question came in that said, Julie, I think you lightly touched on this, but did you and your team test out different numbers of questions in the quiz with regard to drop-off rates? Or how did you go about setting on the number of questions included in the quiz? Yeah, so I actually, um, off the top of my head, I can't exactly remember how that was decided upon. I think what we probably did is relied on Jevit to give us their best-in-class recommendations. Um, our, I think what we came with was a goal of figuring out different attributes and then we kind of went from there. So I think just having um, as few questions as possible while gaining like the most valuable information because there's only so much information you can really get that will help you market down the line. I think like skin type, especially for a skincare brand, I think it depends on the brand. But um, you know, like skin type, skin concern, or like skin wish is really important for skincare brands. But I think it really depends on the brand and who you're marketing to, um, to determine what you want to know. And then just keeping it short and concise and making sure that people are not, um, you know, like we touched on earlier, feeling a little like they're sharing too much. So I think um, four to five is the sweet spot there. And then obviously listening to um, our job our Jebit team to, um, you know, know what's best in class for the industry there. Yeah. And, and you're right. It's, it's what we see is about four to five questions before the drop off and the beauty about, as you can, as you know, in the platform is if you're adding more, the, the, the dashboards and the data is going to tell you, you're going to start to see that drop off immediately mm -hmm. and you can quickly go in and optimize and cut a question or what have you. We will often tell brands, have a purpose, think about the questions that um, will actually drive action on your behalf. You know, um, don't ask something that you actually can't use or play back to the consumer in, in some way. And yeah. so we, when, when we sit down with our clients, we're always first like, well, what are the most important things that will actually drive your personalization and that you need to know? And then, yeah, let's call those down and, you know, you can, you can attack it you know, keep, keep the quizzes to four to five questions, but of course you can then do another quiz and ask them new questions down the road mm -hmm. um, and things like that and just continue to like progressively profile and, yeah. and use the quizzes as a way to do that. 
but yeah. you've got to you got to pick your battles and keep them keep it to four or five at a time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the let's see. Sorry, I'm getting questions in, so I'm just trying to uh, quickly read through them. Has your use of first party data changed at at all from pre COVID to now? Yes, definitely. I think um, I touched on this a little bit earlier, but we were, um, I guess what part of what I've been doing for the brand is expanding upon our CRM flows. So just adding new flows um, based on our increase in data. So now that I have all this wonderful data about skin type um, and skin wish, we're able to kind of expand on the back end all of the flows that people are put in. So, you know, one of the things that we um, launched during the pandemic was our SMS marketing. So now that I know, like, you know, um, what type of skin type these people fall under, like I can market them down the line in other areas and other places um, of the post-purchase funnel. And I think um, because we have so much more data now, there's just way more that I can do, especially in terms of retargeting and paid media. Um, that's a big piece as well. So um, creating affinity audiences and using Google audiences and, um, you know, we are able to connect our data in the back end to provide to, um, you know, Facebook ad manager and just retarget people um, wherever they are, wherever they are. So I think um, the pandemic just basically escalated and speed, sped things up for Bliss, um, you know, because historically we were really focusing on our um, drugstore business and um, our online retailer experience. But um, this has opened so many doors in terms of um, opportunity for us just because, you know, the increase in traffic and revenue. Yeah. Um, and I could I can also speak to some other industries. Uh, we have clients in travel that did a really good job post-COVID of just checking in with people like, are you ready yet? And we're here when you are, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so thinking about, we, we saw a lot of clients like adjust their questions and do, do check-ins and, and how often do you want to hear from us right now? We realize there's a lot going on in the world. Yeah. And again, like I said, a great example is travel, kind of figuring out when are people ready um, and knowing that they might not be right now, but using the data to understand like within six months, within a year, you know, where are you planning to go next, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see a question from me. Has the transition from third party to first party data collection sparked any pushback from other retail clients? Have any been hesitant to take advantage of these strategies or is it a necess necessity that they've come to accept? No, I, I, no pushback whatsoever. I think all, all brands realize again with these, with these privacy changes happening and gen honestly with the pandemic as well and, and how important it is to build a direct relationship with consumers. So um, we haven't, at least the clients that I work with, haven't really seen pushback. I think a lot of, and Julie, you could speak to this too, obviously a lot of um, manufacturers still use second party data with retailers, like if you're co-marketing with CVS or something like that. Mm -hmm. So there's still a role for all of it in, in the universe, but certainly I think everyone understands the priority of first party data right now. Yeah, definitely. Um, all right. I think that is all the questions we got. So I was saving, I was saving the last question. Um, we've kind of hit on this again, but are already, um, but if there's anything else you want to add. So the last question was for companies that haven't already prioritized taking control of first party data, what advice would you give someone looking to do this? I know we, we said start easy and get the, get the wins, but any, anything else you would, you would share? Yeah, I just think um, at the end of the day, just think about the natural purchase flow for a consumer. Think about yourself shopping your own brand. So where would I feel willing to share my data and information that would feel natural? So, you know, obviously like not having like crazy pop-ups that are like, tell me about, like just keeping it really natural and keeping the flow um, kind of easy and quick so that people um, that are willing to provide do and, you know, not just not being like too aggressive about it and just like forcing people to kind of just like share too much. So think about where your consumers are shopping and like where would the most natural place would be where those people would be willing to share more. That, that's a great one. And I know just to give, a, we've obviously talked about product recommendations a lot. I would say another great example um, 
is in a welcome series. So someone just signed up for your loyalty program or just signed up to become an email subscriber. I think Julie, you hit on this too, but that's a very natural place to say, hey, thanks for signing up. We wanna learn a little bit more about you so we can make, you know, we can make this the best experience possible. So yeah. I love I love your point. It's, it's genuine value and it's natural places in the journey um, to have those com conversations. Yeah, I definitely think the welcome flow in terms of email or SMS and um, just like the on-site experience is really, really a great place to learn more and people are willing to learn more about their skin and like what products they want. So, you know, whether it's um, welcome to the brand, would you like to learn more about our products and directing them to a quiz or just, um, you know, taking them to specific pages for their skin type is something that um, as, you know, a marketing team that we like to do. So just keep it really natural, basically. Yeah, keep it natural and helpful. Yeah. <laughs> Provide value to the consumer and keep it natural. I think <laughs> those are two really, really good points to leave everybody with. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen any other questions come in, but if you have any other questions, we uh, please please drop them in now. We're happy to answer. Um, otherwise, we, we can wrap up and get you all on to your next session. <laughs> Give it one more minute. All right, I don't see anything else coming in. Well, Julie, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for sharing. Oh. <laughs> of course, as soon as I go to wrap it up. Uh, <laughs> if you had to share one key lesson to come out of this session, what would it be? Um, oh, sorry, we just got one more too. Um, I, th I think how we just ended it, right? Maybe maybe someone was typing as we were just talking about that. I think I think again, uh, start simple, provide value to the consumer, and put it in a very natural setting. Don't force the data, force the questions. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I would say. <laughs> yeah, um, and then. Julie, one more question just came in that, and we didn't talk about CDPs at all. But do you think having a customer data platform is an assess? is a necessity for any company, large or small, looking to leverage first party data. Yeah, so I think just having centralized data is really important. Um, you know, I've worked for brands that have their data kind of all over the place, and then I've worked um, at places where that have a more centralized database. And I think, um, you know, you're gathering data from all different places, um, especially like when it comes to, you know, you, you have data from your actual D2C website. Um, so your um, what, whatever type of um, like website platform, whatever it's being hosted on, and then you have your ESP, so your email marketing, and then you have your SMS marketing, then you have your paid media. So just having a centralized place for that data is really important and making sure that you're passing those insights across um, kind of all your marketing channels is really important. So um, also importing and exporting data where you're able to. Um, I always ask all of my um, vendors, am I able to share this data with this um, platform that I work on? And like, is that le like, am I legally allowed to kind of pass the data between these two and, um, you know, creating integrations where you can. So um, setting up not just manual imports, but um, like automatic imports where you can with the data is really important. So you're not doing um, kind of like data dumps every so often um, on your own. So just kind of centralizing that is super, super important. And I, and I should add, obviously the, the data that Jebit collects for Bliss is going right into we're not, you know, we don't, we don't view ourselves as, as the data warehouse whatsoever. All mm -hmm. brands are, um, as Julie just spoke to, uh, putting the data into their central customer database. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Great. All right. I think we are done with questions. So now I will wrap up and say, Julie, thank you so much for joining. I hope everyone listening got a nugget or two to take away from this conversation. Um, and yeah, feel free to um, to reach out to me if if you have any other questions and we're too shy to put it in, but I'm happy to answer anything. It's Pam at Jebit.com. Um, and again, Julie, really appreciate your time today. Yeah, so, thank you so much for having me. I'll, always fun to talk to you. <laughs> um, for everyone listening uh, in about, I think it's five minutes at 2.50, the second session, Responsible Advertising in the Age of Data Privacy will begin. And in this session, Haran Patel, the Chief Product Officer at Hybrid Theory, will join Irish Schlesinger of Car Gurus to cover how consumer behavior is shifting in the ever-evolving privacy landscape. 
what the future looks like as the industry moves beyond cookies and more. So to join this session, you're just going to click on session two, responsible advertising in the age of data privacy on the menu on the left. So thank you. And we hope you all join, enjoy the rest of the summit. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks. Bye.